Welcome to our presentation with Tanika Johnson. We're very happy that you were able to join us tonight. Tanika Lewis Johnson is an activist and artist who just received the 2021 Illinois Public Humanities Award. Her work rewrites narratives on segregation and historical marginalization. She uses maps, photographs, and other media to show connections and disconnections between people and their communities. So thank you very much, Tanika, for being with us tonight. I'm excited to have you here, even through Zoom. And we're, we can't wait to hear more about your Folded Map Project. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you all and look forward to our discussion afterward. So why don't we just start with you giving us an idea of sort of how did this project come to mind? What were you thinking when you decided this would be a way to tackle this discussion? Well, without giving too much of the film away, <laughs> um, the, the film definitely covers the origin of the project. So I'll leave that part of the answer for you all to, to view as, and think about as you watch the film. But ultimately, um, it was simply because of me realizing how different my neighborhood looked compared to other neighborhoods that I was getting exposed to. Um, and so the film walks people through um, how I came to realize that. And the way in which I even come to know this to be true is also um, an aspect that is that you can attribute to segregation as well. Um, but ultimately what made me want to do the folded map project in general, what pushed me to want to do it as a project um, was the 2016 presidential election year. So the film takes you on the journey from me as a young girl and all of the moments in my life that led up to me creating the project. And um, the reason that I kind of did it that way is to encourage people to reflect and think about the ways in which um, parts of their life could reveal how segregation has influenced it. Um, you know, because we tend to think of segregation as something that doesn't really impact us personally, but when you think about the relationships you have with people, why your groups of friendships are a certain way. Um, if you live in a segregated city, it's definitely influenced all of those things. So I'm excited for you all to experience what that journey to creating Folded Map is like. In a recent interview, I heard you refer to um, humanity starts with our own narrative. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So, you know, when we try to understand history, if you will, because I think, uh, you know, humanities and all of the ways in which it's expressed, um, arts, writing, um, it really aims to inform us about our past, understanding our lives today, and of course our future. And before we can even begin to understand someone else's story, you know, we have to have some knowledge of our own personal history, um, how we came to live where we grew up, what our parents and grandparents um, went through, how their life decisions influenced where we ended up in life. Um, once you kind of know your own personal story, it makes it that much easier to know that someone else has a story, that another location has a story that attached to that story is another culture that might be different. So I think, you know, knowing and finding out 
your own personal history, your family history. It's good practice to learning how to develop empathy um, with others who might be different than you, who might look different than you, who might have a different lived experience. And so, you know, really using some of those inquisitive skills um, and applying them to understanding your own history definitely helps you connect to to other people and their history. And then obviously, once you know that history, you'll be able to write about it. You could do uh, express it through art, you know. So humanities is that transferring of uh, information and storytelling through a lot of different mediums. But but ultimately, it's it's looking looking to history to help inform and understand the future. And that's ultimately what I think uh, the humanities is. Thank you for that question. It's a beautiful question. Okay, we are connecting with our audience. So we'll oh, see if they have some questions. Yeah, we have all just watched the film. Oh, okay. I thought it was going to be um, going on now. I'm so happy to know that they've all watched it. <laughs> I'm excited to see what thoughts and reflections they've had, if there was anything that they connected with, if there was anything they had questions about, anything that's sitting on their hearts and minds. I, I, I'm excited to, to hear it. One of our viewers has just commented that he was very moved by the film, not a question so much, but just its connection to uh, the systems within communities. Ah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I often, um, you know, had I been there, I definitely would have opened up the conversation asking the audience, you know, before questions, you know, what is it you're feeling after watching it while you were watching it? So I definitely welcome reflections. They don't necessarily have to come in the form of a question. And sometimes you know, you have to process something for a few minutes before you uh, figure out a question. Uh, but yes, no, the more reflections, the better. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a question, but I really appreciate you all sharing with me um, what it makes you think about and, and, and if it moved you and, and, you know, if there's any parts of it that made you um, compare it to your own experience. I was curious as you were um, filming, like, did you, especially toward the early parts of the interviews, did you notice body language? Did you feel people were a little nervous about answering some of the questions in front of each other? Yes, that's such a great question, um, which is why I call the hour long footage of the MAP twins meeting each other that's on Folded Map Project's website. If you go to MAP twins and click on videos, the full hour long video that was a part of the original exhibition. Um, I call it social justice reality TV <laughs> because uh, the first MAP twins that met each other, uh, Jennifer and Wade, um, I just only brought an audio recorder because I thought, oh, it's a conversation. I'll have my camera. I got it covered. But once they started like talking, I was like, oh, they're using a lot of body language. This is really important. And the photos don't capture it as much. So I knew instantly, I was like, oh, the next time I have to meet, like, I have to record this. I have to record, I have to do video of all of the MAP twins because I didn't realize how much body language um, you know, reveals how people feel, um, their, their comfort level with certain questions or how they, how they move or adjust their bodies to kind of like reassure each other. So, um, yeah, it was definitely early on in the process where I made that adjustment because I was only going to do portraits and have an audio recording, but I was like, oh no, this, this body language is, is too good. And if I had not done that, we wouldn't have the classic 
little part where Carmen and Bridget, uh, the black woman Carmen from Inglewood and the white woman from uh, Rogers Park named Bridget, where Bridget tells how much her house is <laughs> and Carmen makes that <laughs> very strong facial expression. I wouldn't have been able to capture that if it if I didn't do video. So yeah, I realized that body language was saying a lot. Um, and, and people were nervous. Um, you know, there were a couple MAP twins who live on the north side of Chicago that changed the price of their house when I asked them in front of their MAP twin. They they made it go down like $5,000, like nothing significant for me to be like, oh no, you said it was this amount. Um, but it was still a change in the, the price. Um, and I just assumed that, you know, maybe that was because in the moment they felt some way, they felt bad that their house was, you know, worth more. Um, so people do a lot of different things to kind of compensate for the information and, and emotions that they're processing. So yes, I knew early on, I have to do video. <laughs> Okay, Tanika, you might have to repeat this question because I don't think my voice is coming through to the audience. It's just coming through to you. So oh, but okay. here's an audience question. Do you think we're going to learn from areas or neighborhoods like Cabrini Green, for example? Um, the question is, do I think we're going to learn from areas like Cabrini Green? Um, well, for the person that even asked that question, it feels like that person has identified something that can be learned from Cabrini Green. Um, anything that can be taken away from Cabrini Green or what happened to Cabrini Green, how it was even created, why it was even created. Um, we can learn all of those things from so many neighborhoods, um, unfortunately. Um, a lot of predominantly Black neighborhoods um, have experienced the same kind of life cycle as Cabrini Green did. But what's most interesting about Cabrini Green is, you know, it's, it's public housing. So there is a clear connection between uh, government investment and government disinvestment <laughs> um, because the landlords of those properties is the government. So the fact that those public housing, um, ultimately neighborhoods were not taken care of, um, that people had so many issues um, that ultimately resulted into an environment that wasn't necessarily um, the ideal living situation. Mm -hmm. That was not the fault of the residents who lived there. And so if that is a lesson that can be taken away from Cabrini Green, uh, public housing, how public housing is treated, how the government or city elected officials um, treat public housing, that can also be learned in a lot of other ways as well, um, examining, you know, predominantly black neighborhoods or communities of color. The ultimate line, the through line between Cabrini Green and other neighborhoods that, that don't include public housing, but are communities of color, specifically black communities, is that there is a devaluation of um, those communities because of who lives there. And it is not by coincidence that predominantly Black neighborhoods, regardless of the class level, uh, get treated very differently uh, by the city. They don't have the same um, allocation of city resources. And I think that's something that we can take away. But there's so many lessons. And I definitely think that we can learn a lot from 
um, public housing and housing, how critical housing is and, and housing even being a commodity in a capitalist country, um, how all of those things really influence um, or directly impact one's life and, you know, ultimately makes it easy to kind of be discriminated against. So I definitely think we can learn a lot from examination of the life cycle of, of Cabrini Green. Um, but I also feel that those same lessons can be learned um, examining other predominantly Black neighborhoods as well. Thank you for that question. Another audience question that you'll have to repeat is that it sounds from the movie that you started this project with notices and mailbox. And we're curious how many map, ten, map twins did you actually connect and how many maybe did not want to participate with you? <laughs> um, I solicited, oh, so the question is how many map twins did I solicit um, and how many map twins ended up you know, did I end up connecting? And were there any people who didn't want to be a part of it? Um, so first and foremost, I didn't even focus on the people who didn't want to be a part of it. I don't even know if there were people who didn't want to be a part of it because they didn't reach out, but it was a lot of people who did. And I pretty much stopped kind of trying to connect people after I had a solid um, six, eight people from the very specific north side blocks that I wanted to connect to the residents who lived in Inglewood. So I would say we passed out about 80 to 100 solicitation packets. Um, and that was primarily to the people who lived on Chicago's north side predominantly white neighborhoods because I live on Chicago South Side and there is a travel distance about 45 minutes. So, you know, on my weekends, I, I would try to, um, you know, do solicitations, but I, I needed something a little bit more robust. So that's when I was able to um, partner with Loyola University and have some of their interns do like deploy all of the solicitations. And so I waited for two weeks for people to respond. And that's when my phone started ringing. I, I got a lot of people who were interested, but I pretty much stopped answering my phone <laughs> after, like I said, a good six or eight people um, contacted me and said, sure, I would love to be a part of this little weird project. Um, so I have done a total of recorded total of five map twins. Um, the fifth map twin I did prior to the pandemic. And that represented a side, the western side of Chicago. And that's a little more intricate to explain geographically, but that was the last map twin pair that I did. Um, I haven't even uploaded their footage to the official website and I haven't even debuted it to, to the larger public um, because it was the last map twins and it represented a different side of the city. But so far as the actual project, when it was exhibited, it was a total of four map twins. That was about, that was about 12 people. Cause even though I'm saying twins, um, some households had two people, some households had one, some had three. So um, yes, but four, four sets of MAP Twins is what I did uh, when the project was exhibited in 2018. And then I did another uh, set of MAP Twins, um, like I said, prior to the pandemic in 2019, 2020. So a total of five. However, um, I expanded the project to include a folded MAP action kit, if you could see. It's a wonderful kit that has a workbook, that invites all the other people, the close to a thousand people who signed up on Folded Maps contact list that I created while it was being exhibited in 2018. Since then, the list has, has, has grown to like close to a thousand people, all of them saying they wish they could find their map twin, they wanna be a map twin. So because of that, I created the Folded Map Action Kit as a way for all of those people 
to get involved with the project because I knew I was like, I got other projects I want to work on. I know I'm not going to be doing map twins for the rest of my life. So the action kit um, walks people through um, the stories of a couple of map twins in these brochures. And then there's a letter from me explaining to people what the project is. And then there is the workbook. The workbook includes instructions on how to geographically find your map twin. But it is an art project. It is not a social, official social science research. So you don't have to find your exact map twin. So I tell people, if you don't feel like finding your exact map twin or you know, figuring out the coordinates using Chicago's grid map, just simply find a neighborhood that's racially and economically different. And unfortunately in Chicago is very easy to do. Just find a neighborhood that's racially and economically different and go run errands. So this workbook has a list of errands that I invite people to run in their map twin neighborhood um, that speaks to how each sector of business treats neighborhoods. So there's errands like go buy an organic apple. We often hear consistently across the country that in segregated places, um, there is less access to fresh produce in predominantly Black neighborhoods. Um, the fact that it exists, that this is a reality in um, a lot of predominantly Black neighborhoods throughout our country, that lets you know it's systemic. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the residents of that neighborhood. So it's a system, it's an industry that that values that community that way. So to go run to go run the errand of going to the grocery store and finding an organic apple, go take out twenty dollars at an ATM, go visit a local library or post office, um, go buy lotion. You'd be amazed to find out how different that is. <laughs> so it's very simple errands that you would run in your own neighborhood um, to just do it in another neighborhood because. That's as close as possible as I could think of to help someone experience walking in somebody else's shoes, to really truly understand what disparity looks like and to know that it's beyond just our individual relationships. It's also the systems themselves, the industries. Um, Taking out $20 from an ATM is, you know, for people to understand how the financial banking industry treats and supplies services to neighborhoods differently based on what? Leave that up for you to think about. But the most important thing is to recognize that there is a difference in access um, and to start thinking about why is that? Why is there a different um, level of accessibility to banking institutions? in certain neighborhoods, why? Why is there a different level of access to produce, to restaurants, to entertainment, like why? So the action kit helps people um, at least get introduced into their map twin neighborhood to understand on a more personal level um, what it's like to be a resident in that neighborhood. And that's the ultimate goal of the map twins is to try and see um, life from your map twins point of view and for you to allow yourself to, to come up with more questions or to make connections. I, I de don't necessarily want to draw those conclusions for you, but with the action kit, you can, we also encourage people to share your experience, to upload, you know, if you have any thoughts, any, um, writings, any photos that you wanted to take, um, to upload that to the website, um, so that we can start to get back information about what people feel, um, about what they learn. So this is another way that I've kind of extended the map twinning beyond um, the actual project and, and exhibition. So to date, the I have mailed about 700 of those folded map action kits. And um, hopefully now that the weather is breaking, um, people will be getting out to, to do the actual action kit. Um, I launched it during the pandemic because I knew that with everything going on in the world, the, the reckoning that we were kind of dealing with, 
um, through the pandemic regarding race. Um, I knew that people would want to take action. And so I created the action kit and, and um, delivered it to the public during the pandemic because I thought it was like an easy pandemic appropriate way to still engage in the project because you don't need to meet someone to do the action kit. You can do it all by yourself and it includes doing stuff you were gonna have to do anyway, going to the store or whatever. Um, so that's the extension of the project. So there's so many people who have um, done the action kit already. There is a church who did the action kit and they found their map twin church on the south side of Chicago and, and those two churches had an event and they invited me to it. So, I mean, really I can, I can say that that church twin um, is another map twin. Um, there's two schools right now that are um, working towards doing engagement with each other. They're, they're MAP twins, um, but they haven't done the official meetup yet. So there's a lot of MAP twins in the making um, beyond the project. Well, Tanika, I appreciate that so much. And I hope that we can get um, maybe a copy of that toolkit, because one of the things we have done is create a Salina map that we hope people will come into the Art Center and Internet Act with, similar to some of the questions you asked, asked in your film. Oh, yes, that would be great. And I would love to um, share the contact list um, for people to sign up to actually get the action kit. Um, and we can mail it to them. We can also mail you all um, some of the action kits for you all to have there uh, as a reference or for people to take and use. So yes, I can definitely get um, some actual folder map action kit folders to you all so that people can have. But if you know there are individuals in the audience who are really interested to know what the action kit says right now, you can go to foldermapproject.com and you can download the action kit. It's not obviously going to be the beautiful folder here, but um, it is a printed PDF version. If you have enough ink and you want to use it, we try to minimize as much ink as possible. It's black and white. So there you go. But you can definitely go to the folder map website to download it anytime, or you can sign up to receive um, an actual hard copy. But as I said, I am more than happy to mail you all some of the action kits so that you can have for people to to take. Okay, do we have any other audience questions for Tanika? Give them a second to text up to me if they need to. Yes, definitely take time. What I would like to say is, um, you know, definitely uh, follow me on Instagram. Um, that's one of the ways in which we can stay connected. Um, and if you think of a question, then you can feel free to slide in my DMs and ask. Um, and also, it's a way for you to kind of stay connected. Excuse the noise. My window is open. Um, to stay connected, uh, to learn about my other projects as well. So my Instagram handle is Tonika J. If you don't have a question right now and you think of one later, you can ask me on Instagram or Twitter. On Twitter, I am Tonika GJ. G is my middle initial. Okay, thank you, Tonika. We're gonna let you log off. And then I have a couple of announcements to make and hopefully it won't echo. Um, thank you everyone for coming out tonight and for Tanika for zooming in no problem. and for every all the guidance she has given us with her beautiful work that is in the art center please come out and see dissonance and resonance because uh, it is an excellent exhibition and we're so proud to have Tanika as part of that thank you for having me it was so great to hear your reflections and get your questions enjoy Hey, I want to encourage the audience to come out on June the 16th for Lunch and Learn. I don't know what to do about this echo. I'm so sorry. Um, 
Maria Johnson will be with us to give an in-depth look at segregation through Salinas history. That is a free event. And then of course, we have the Salina map in our education wing. And we really would like you to come, answer the questions, pin your answers onto the map as we start to explore how people experience Salina itself um, based on the work of Tanika Johnson. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and I hope we will see you soon.